The idea behind all my presentations, all my workshops, all my work is to get you to think about light differently. Uh, think about light in the abstract. Anybody know what I mean, and I mean by that in the abstract? Anybody? I'm asking you guys, no? Okay, before I was a photographer, I was in another industry. So I bring all my knowledge from that industry to my photography. How I build my sets, how I work with certain equipment. Um, I have a good thing with my mind's eye. I can see things and assemble them, all right? I have some of that here for you to help you. So what I want you to do is to pay attention to the lighting. And you may never use one of these techniques, but once you've seen it used, you'll have it in the back of your head. So say you go to a job or someone calls you, a client calls you up and they say, um, I need this or I need that, and you can't afford that um, modifier to do the job, you can use something else. And that's always my goal, is to get you to think about light differently, okay? Okay, the gear for the workshop is this. Besides regular light stands and a speed light and uh, radio triggers, I use a small rogue flash bender. If you've not used rogue flash benders before, check them out. Um, they are a fantastic product. All right, a PhotoFlex 45 inch convertible umbrella. California Sunbounce Micro Mini with its attendant grip head. Quarter inch foam core uh, V flats. Two 42 by 72 impact 5 in 1 reflectors. And a homemade reflector holder. And that's it. One speed light, 16 looks with that small amount of gear. Okay, we're going to go over all of this. Okay, so to begin with, who here shoots events? Anybody here shoots events? All right, good, we have a fairly decent, okay, good. And when you shoot events, you put something on top of your, you put speed light on your camera, then you put something on top of that to modify your light or to bounce it around the room. One of the great, best, and easiest ways to get started at an off-camera flash is simply put that on your speed light and take your speed light, put it on a light stand. So here, I'm gonna give you all my exposure information and a behind the scenes shot and a final from each, uh, each look. I start always at 1 1 25th of a second at 5.6. My ISO for this shot is 500. White balance daylight, and I use a small rogue flash bender. If you are not taking a custom white balance, set your white balance to daylight and you'll be very close uh, right out of the gate. So when you go back later in, into whatever software you're using, you can copy and paste your, your edit, but they're all the same. So here I'm in a studio in New Haven. This is my friend's studio. I have a speed light on a light stand, a small rogue flash bender mounted to it, and I'm bouncing light around the room, and that's all I'm doing. This is look number one. So who wants to keep count? Anybody? No? Okay. And here's a final. All right? How easy is that? Anybody? Easy. It's incredibly easy. All I did was take that flash, got it off my camera, put it on a light stand, bounced it around the room, and that's it. That's a final. I did some processing on her skin, and that's pretty much out of my camera. Look number two, reflective umbrella. If you're a photographer, the, one of the most important tools in your lighting kit is, a, is an umbrella. Get yourself a nice convertible. One that you can take the black backing off of, okay? You can use it reflective style or take the black backing off and use it shoot through style. I have a couple of different looks here. Some are simple. One's a little uh, really, really interesting and cool and always gets that aha, wow, that's pretty cool. Um, again, my exposure is 1 1 25th of a second, 5.6. ISO is 200, white balance is daylight, okay? You're gonna see this over and over and over again until we get to the more advanced um, uh, shooting style, shooting looks, where ISO plays a larger part because so much light uh, gets lost. I'm using a PhotoFlex 45 inch convertible umbrella. All right, I've owned PhotoFlexes for my entire career in photography and uh, I really like them. The newer PhotoFlexes have fiber composite spines, so if they fall over outside, they don't break. Okay, this is a basic one light portrait. Okay, my key light is approximately 45 degrees by 45 degrees off of my subject. That means it's roughly 45 degrees this way and 45 degrees up and coming back down on my subject. I have a seamless uh, paper background and here's my final. What do we think? Simple, right? Incredibly simple. Keep it simple and you'll be amply rewarded with great results all the time. Okay. 
The second look, or the third look rather, sorry, I'm losing count already, you see that? Uh, is a reflective umbrella with a reflector. My reflector of choice is the California Sunbound system. Uh, it's a little expensive, but it's well worth the money. You can purchase a bracket that mounts it to a light stand, so if you're like me and you work alone, you can, don't have to pay an assistant, okay? I'll roll into a job, set up my lighting, set up my uh, reflector, and I can go right to work alone. 1 1 25th of a second again at 5.6. ISO is 200, white balance is daylight, and my California sun bounce with the grip head. And there it is, all right? You can get change your look, you can change your lighting look by moving things around. You can change your exposure by uh, bringing your light in closer, right? This is the inverse square law. I keep my key light usually four to five feet from my subject, and my reflector, I move around to get the fill light that I want. And here's a final, right? Beautiful fill light on the left side of her face. She has that gorgeous, gorgeous hair. The hair is awesome. Um, she turned her head a little bit, but the reflector opened up the entire, entire left side of her body. I think did a really great job. You can also change this look up a little bit by using the silver side of the reflector. I prefer white, because I think the white is a bit softer and less contrasty, but silver works just as well. Okay, we're on to look four. We're cruising right through this, so I can't wait for your questions. Okay, side light reflective. This comes under the, uh, the guise of just moving your light around. You know, there's no crazy things here. There's no uh, formula to follow. A lot of this is just getting your creativity up and running. All right, 1 1 25th of a second at 5.6 again. ISO 200, white balance, daylight. All that I did was move my light to one side of my subject. Okay, now if you look, the light's very dramatic on her face already. So I had her turn into the light, like that, all right? I only lit her from just one side only. When you do this, <clears throat> the light's exiting the um, umbrella in such a broad swath that it's lighting the background, and it's lighting her, and it's giving this beautiful uh, shadow fall off on the left side of her face, okay? And all I did was move my light. I didn't change my position. I turned her into the light, and that was it. Okay, next look. Crunched umbrella. I love doing this. This is a great look because this uh, it keeps you from buying an expensive uh, beauty dish. You don't need to buy a beauty dish if you try this. This is one of the great things about using an umbrella. All right, again, all my exposure settings remain the same. I took the umbrella and collapsed it over the light. And that's all that I did, okay? Now look at how dramatic that light is on her face. And all the light shut down on the background. And all I did was walk over, click that little button, and collapse that umbrella from here right over to here. And just let it sit on top of the speed light. I had her look up into the light again. The background is darker, okay? You can see that the light's a little bit harder. You can see that on the left side, on her left arm, where that shadow from her dress or her torso is showing you that little strip of light on her left arm. But well, look at that, that's amazing. And all I did was shut the, shut the umbrella down. That was it, okay? This is another atypical one light portrait. Shoot through umbrella with the reflector. All right, exposure all remains the same. 1 1 25th, 5.6, ISO 200, white balance, daylight, and my California Sun Bounce with Micro Mini. All I did was add the reflector to one side. All right, I want you to take a look at where the reflector is. Not exactly at its position, but look how I have it mounted on the light stand. Instead of putting your reflector up to one side, move it like this and give it some angle. If you have a reflector from one side, you're getting fill only this way. If you bring it down, have your key light here, you're bringing fill back up all under here. And that's what we want to do. We want to fill light under the chin, under the nose, under the eyes. You actually are wrapping light around your subject, okay? And if you look, I know it's hard to tell here, my light is actually aimed to my reflector. Keep that central hotspot off the subject. Move that central hotspot to the reflector, and then you, you literally wrap your subject in light, and it's soft and pleasing. There's a final from the selection, right? It's a little warmer in tone, okay? Beautiful fill light up underneath, coming up this way, under her chin, under her nose, under her eyes, under her hair. 
Okay, we're gonna stop right here for questions. This is my oh, about my one third point. Anybody? Go. What's your name? Diego. Diego. What can I do for you? Um, I just want to find out well, what's the setting on the actual flash. Is it on, in a manual mode or? Yep. Okay. Diego asks, what's the setting on the flash? All my flashes are set the same. My key light is always a manual mode, half power. Every shot you'll see here in this slideshow was shot in manual mode and at half power. So you scroll the mode button down to hit M, okay? If you shoot Canon, you'll go from ETTL to M. If you shoot Nikon, you scroll through TTL, ETTL, TTL, um, RPT, GN, A, till you finally hit M for manual. Then you just set the one over two, half power, okay? I always use battery packs uh, for good recycle time and I'm getting working apertures of 5.6 with an ISO of 200. With higher ISOs, you can push that to eight. If you went to ISO 400, you can push that to F8, and you're entering strobe light territory. Good, what's your name, hon? Ruth. Ruth? Uh, pocket Wizards. Pocket Wizards, yeah, I use Pocket Wizards. That's coming at the end. Okay, um, I do use Pocket Wizards. Uh, I use Pocket Wizards plus threes. I run a lot of workshops, so that means that I get a lot of different cameras coming through. I've had Sigma, Sony, Pentax, Olympus, um, Canon G10s, 11s, 12s. I've had uh, this um, Olympus OMD come through, and the pocket wizards are basically uh, walkie-talkies. Put on top of the camera, this is camera telling flash to fire, and that's it. I do use a light meter. Richard asked if I use a light meter, and yes, I do use a light meter uh, to get my initial exposures. Um, sometimes I don't. Working in the field, I don't. Working in a workshop setting, I don't, because there's no time for that. There really is no time. Who, if anybody was here at the Central Park uh, event with us last year, we had 283 workshop attendees, so there just wasn't any time to use a light meter. In the back, what's your name? Charles. What can I do for you, Charles? What lens do you shoot with? A 5 No, I, uh, lens, Ch Charles asked what lens I use. My two <coughs> bread and butter lenses are a 50 millimeter. Uh, actually, I'm a Nikon guy, so a 50 millimeter 1.8 D lens and a 70 to 200 VR. Um, I love the 70 to 200. I love that long compression, you know, and that distance. So Lauren asked, "With you shooting outside, what's different, right?" So you're shooting indoors in some, on location somewhere else. What, what do you mean? Not in your studio. Oh, if, I'm on, if, I'm if I'm on location somewhere else, what do I have to take into account? Is that what you're asking? Um, when you're shooting, no matter where you're shooting, inside or outside, take account of the ambient light. Okay, try to bring some ambient light in if you can, or if not, you shut that down with exposure. Okay, shutter speed and aperture combined. All right, um, you can boost ISO if you want to bring some ambient light in or bring your ISO down. Um, where are you shooting mostly, Lauren? Um, events. Events? Yeah. yeah. People's home. Yep. The Usually when I'm outside, I'm in my shutter speed's around two hundredths of a second to 250. I, I do a high shutter speed and um, I adjust my aperture and ISO from there uh, with my flashes set to manual mode at half power. Uh, I have some outside shots in here coming later. Okay, in the back, what can I do for you? Uh, sundown position on the side light for the last go around. How far away from the subject, how far away from the light? Um, three to four feet from this, what's your name, hon? Cindy. Cindy, All right, so Cindy asks how far is the reflector from our subject? Reflector's usually three to four feet from the subject and I move it to taste. I move it in or out to taste. If I take a shot and I like it, it stays. If I take a shot and I don't like it, it gets moved. Nothing here. Um, I want to. I want to. I know what you're going for. Cindy's asking for the formula. Yep, that's a good starting point, right? Everything here is a starting point for you. Right? I'm giving you all these different ways and all these different looks, but it's all a starting point for you. Your camera may not expose the same as mine, so your exposure may be a little bit different. Okay, that's why we shoot in raw because we can push it up or down if we like it, darker or brighter, all right? But um, these are all jump off points for you. Okay, my speed light's on the light stand. It's close to the wall to the left. The Rogue Flash Bender's on it, and I'm just pointing it to the ceiling. The Rogue Flash Bender helps to keep light from going uh, down, all right? It's helping to keep the light up. And I want that light up because I want to turn my room into my softbox, which is exactly what you do if you're an event shooter and you have something on your top of your uh, flash. You keep it on the bottom and you keep light from coming down. And that's all that I did. That's literally, this is literally out of the camera, except for some skin softening and uh, removal of, you know, the normal things you would take out in somebody's photo. 
can you shoot at a nine foot ceiling uh, for a studio? Or no? What's the minimum? What's the size of the, the, the tall the walls? For bouncing your flash, John? Exactly. Um, here, this ceiling was probably 15 feet. Okay? Uh, you have to play with your ISO and your aperture. You have to play with exposure here. Because what happens is the light is so inefficient that you're just losing so much of it. So if we go back, I think I was at ISO 500. See that? So I got my base exposure, took my initial shot, didn't like it. But I want to stay in an aperture of 5.6. That's a good portrait aperture. Okay, I need a shutter speed that I know I can get handheld. And I'll boost ISO here in order to get my exposure right. Yes? What, what's your name? Sorry. In a case like this, how would you rather change the ISO or the uh, flash power? Um, I work all my flashes, my key light flashes at half power, so I'm going to stay at half power. All right, so Raphael asked if you get a similar effect if you'd use clamshell lighting with the crunched umbrella. Um, I've never tried it. I think it's too tight of a light source. Um, it's really, if you have a beauty dish and you really work that beauty dish, you get this kind of look out of it, okay? Um, but it, if you were using a beauty dish here, that beauty dish would not be aimed at the subject. It would be off to one side because you're catching only light coming out of the dish, all right, which is very much similar to this where you're catching only light coming out of that little cone, that reverse cone, okay? Um, if you use a dish for over and under beauty, you're getting a lot of light that's wrapping around your subject. So I've never tried it that way, but um, maybe I will. Maybe that's look number 17. Thank you. <laughs> okay, what's your name, hon? Denise, what can I do for you? I'm a couple of feet above my subject, two to three feet above, and about three to four feet, maybe five feet away. All right? When you're setting your key light, a great way to learn how to set your key light or your main light is stand in a room. Stand in a square room in your apartment or your house or wherever. Okay? Try to choose a square room because that guy kind of works the best. Stand in the middle of it. And then while you're standing here, point to the intersection of where the wall, two walls meet and the ceilings meet. That's where your key light goes. That's approximately your starting point. All right? Roughly 45 degrees up and 45 degrees off your main subject. And you got it. Okay? Jeff asks, how deep do you uh, put the umbrella in? So when you're using an umbrella bracket, you undo the knuckle, the nut, and you slip it in. Usually I go around between three and six inches. Okay? And you can play with that for different effects. All right? um, when I do a high key background and I'm using reflective umbrellas, I pull them almost all the way through to keep that spill from coming out. Usually with a shoot through umbrella, I'm about maybe between four and six inches. You go like this, right? You got it. That's about all you need. You're going to get a lot of spill out of the backside of an umbrella, but that's okay. That's okay. You know, let that light just go off where it goes and um, use what you're getting through the umbrella. Okay? Shall we move forward? Yeah. Yes. All right, let's go. All right, shoot through direct. I like this look a lot. And you're gonna, you'll see the next couple of looks, you're gonna see a lot of uh, magazine covers and things of that nature because it's very soft, flat lighting. You wanna light your subject softly and flatly, but not make it flat light. Okay, you still want that detail. So again, my, all my exposure information remains the same. I'm one twenty-fifth of a second at 5.6, ISO 200, white balance daylight. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm on the wrong, oh yeah, bare head flash. Oh, I have the wrong slide there, I'm sorry. Um, shoot through umbrella, I apologize for that. This is a shoot through umbrella, it's right above me. And it's right above me and it's right here, okay? And I'm shooting right underneath it, all right? You'll see this kind of look all over the place. And I like it because it has a very nice drop shadow. All the light is soft, okay? This is my friend Bernadette. And if anybody's taken a workshop with me or been here with me, she comes down with me uh, often. She's a very good friend of mine. And she modeled for a workshop I ran um, in Chelsea. So I put my light above my head and I take my shot and this is what I have, okay? She's, only, she's right up against the wall, okay? She's just off the wall enough to stand. You have a very nice soft drop shadow behind her. It's almost imperceptible, all right? The light is soft and flat on her, but it's not flat. It's, she's flatly lit, but the light's not flat. There's still drama and detail. The nice thing about photographing somebody like this is that light fills all their pores. 
So later in post-processing, because you're not cross-lighting, when you cross-light, all that light's going across the pores and you're seeing a lot of things that you probably don't want to see. When you flat light, all your pores get filled in. So post-processing becomes easier, all right? Because you don't have to remove all those blemishes because you don't see them because the light's filling in all the pores on your face. I like this lighting setup a lot. I think it's, it's incredibly simple and it's really easy to execute. You get some uh, white wall, some white seamless paper, and you're done. Okay, over and under beauty. This speaks to Raphael's question, over and under beauty. Um, over and under beauty is a little bit different. I, I love doing it. And the, the two shots I brought in to show you was the first time I ever shot over and under beauty with a speed light. And I did it, it's probably about six years ago when I was working my way out of strobe lighting and working my way into speed lighting. So my shutter and my aperture, my shutter is faster, my aperture is deeper, all right, because your light's a little bit closer to your subject. You have a reflector below and you're bouncing light back up and you have a lot of exposure going on. ISO is still 200, white balance is daylight, I have a shoot through umbrella and my California sun bounce underneath, all right. This speaks to being able to work alone and I love working alone. I love assistance, but you know what? Sometimes I just like to be alone. Not antisocial. Okay, so actually this, so I'm making my exit from strobe light into speed light. I shot a, a good friend of mine who was working with IPM models here in New York City, full figure models, and uh, I didn't have my studio yet, so this is my living room. Up above is a Nikon SB800, manual mode at half power. Okay, I have an older Pocket Wizard Plus 2 and a Nikon SD8 battery pack. Below is my California Sunbounce uh, reflector with the grip head. Everything's mounted, ready to go. She comes in, has a seat. I rattle off a shot and I get that. Yeah, who said that? <laughs> that was a collective whoa, that was awesome. All right, this is a beautiful way to light people, especially females. Right? You have this beautiful light. It's, it's, when you set this up at home, you'll see it. Because I want you all to do that's your homework. You guys to do at least one of these, okay, when you go home. And I love Over and Under Beauty because her face is so round and perfect. That light just hits her and, oh my God, it's fantastic. Okay? That, went out, that was a cover of her comp card for a couple of years, which I was really proud of. Um, she did some really great work with I, with, through IPM models and uh, she's really a great person. Okay, what look are we on? 11? All right, 12, 13, okay. All right, bounce into reflector. Who asked me about shooting outside? What's your name again, hon? Lauren. Lauren, okay, Lauren asked me about shooting outside. <clears throat> my exposure changes here because this next series of shots is taken outside, all right? Um, I brought a model in and we did some portfolio work and I did a lot of different things, and some of my work in this slideshow was, was done for this slideshow, um, but I didn't know it back then. So anyways, so I'm outside, so my shutter speed's 2 50th of a second. My aperture's 5.6, ISO is 200. So if you go back, I know I'm probably boring you all to death with exposure, because it's all the same, right? It's all the same. Um, I'm using a bare head flash, no modifier, no omni bounce on it, and a reflector, my California Sun Bounce Micro Mini. And what I've done here is I've put the reflector up high and I've pushed the light into it. Okay? So, very similar to the very first look that we saw where the light's bouncing around the room, I just have the light bouncing into the reflector and coming back to the model. Where it was a hazy late summer day. Um, and we're in this location, it's full of graffiti, it was nasty. It's actually a skate park inside, skateboard park. All the kids were skateboarding, you can hear all the noise inside, and we were outside shooting, and it was a lot of fun. And um, if you don't have a wall to bounce your light off of, bring a reflector, and you have a wall you can bounce your light off of. One of the things I like about the California Sunbound system is that you can put it onto a grip head and put it onto a light stand. So again, I'm working alone. Okay, I know Lastalite now makes something I think you can mount to a light stand with a speed light bracket or something like that. Research your, um, your manufacturers to find something that suits your need. And there's a final, okay? 
Great. It was easy. Here's a piece of cake. I stood her up against the, the, the garage door with all that crazy graffiti behind her, rattle off a bunch of shots, and then we moved on from there. Okay. So having a reflector gives you a wall to bounce off of. All right? All right? Okay. Direct flash. This is another um, technique you'll see a lot of. And I think I just saw this. Uh, in GQ magazine, um, I, who was the cover? Beyonce was the cover. She was shot a little bit different, but it's a very similar idea. You'll see this a lot on white covers of magazine, Glamour magazine, Vanity Fair, whatever. The model goes up against the white wall, and you just hit them direct. As long as you get that flash off the axis of the camera, it changes the dynamic of how the flash interacts with your subject. What I really like about it is the way you get a nice, hard, short drop shadow. So again, what's my exposure? At 5.6, ISO 200, right? I'm going to keep saying this over and over. White balance daylight, bare head flash. OK, so I'm in this studio in New Haven. Um, this was during a workshop. I took this during a workshop because I finally had a big enough room to take a photo where I can see and show you how this works. Because my studio is not that big. So I have a bare head flash off to the left. At this time, that's a Nikon SB900, OK? Manual mode, half power. I have her up against a white uh, seamless paper. Look at the shadow behind her, OK? There it is, All right? And you'll see this a lot on the front, on the covers of magazines. It's a really simple, easy look to execute, very easy to execute. And you would be surprised. It's utterly amazing how the light interacts with your subject and not only that, you don't clip any highlights. You've got this direct flash with no clipped highlights. You know, if you put this flash on your camera, it would look completely different. You can modify this look. If you move to one side, right? If you move to the other side, if you put the flash a little bit off to the right, a little bit more off to the left, all right? If you pull your subject off the white, that shadow becomes deeper, okay? And it's really a great way to do something because how many, how much equipment do we have? Flash. We have a flash and a light stand. That's all we have. And that's awesome, isn't it? You can say it is. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I, I'm going to stop for one second. Actually, I think I'm going to stop on this slide. Um, we'll take our next set of questions at this juncture and then we'll go from there. And Lauren, go ahead, hon. How do you have to be that far away? Yeah. Yes, okay, Lauren asked, you have to be that far away. So I'm going to go back up one slide. OK, you do have to be that far away. And the reason for that is look at that spread of light. You can see the spread of light coming from the speed light. It's exiting the speed light and just going out all over the place. It actually fills that room, and that ceiling has got to be 15 feet high. OK? Um, and you also have to shoot from where the light stand is, so it's good to use a longer lens. If you step forward, if I step forward and maybe shot from where the edge of the white seamless paper is taped to the floor, you would see my shadow on the white because the light would be hitting me. OK, so you need to shoot back. All right, you need a lot of room. You, um, you don't need a lot of room. I could do it in this room, quite honestly. And I can probably do it going this way, in the 16-foot way. Absolutely. Put the light right behind me here, shoot right at the light about here, and put my subject up against the wall. So you can do it in a small space. Your exposure will change. So don't call me up and say, Bob, I did what you did, but my exposure was f8, not 5.6. OK? So once again, everybody's exposure may be a little bit different depending on your location. But these are all jump off points. Yes, what's your name? Hey, Robert Charles. What can I do for you, Charles? In uh, number four and in this one, it looks like you're shooting. When I shoot key light, I try to shoot eye level. It looks like you're shooting a little below eye level, aren't you? I do shoot a touch below eye level. So what's your name again? Charles. Charles. So Charles asks um, if I shoot below eye level. I do. Um, I tend to squinch down a little bit, and that puts your subject up in the frame. So what you are looking at the image, it looks more like you're looking at them at eye level. Okay, this is a thing from, like, uh, th this is a fashion kind of thing, where uh, you would use a waist level viewfinder and a Mamiya or a Hasselblad, and your your camera is literally down here. Okay, so the subject looks like it's they, they he or she is higher in the frame. So it looks more like they're looking at you directly, OK, as opposed to up or slightly down. A lot of my subjects, I pose a lot of my subjects standing. I like the standing pose. Um, 
A reason for that is I had a gentleman come in for a corporate headshot and he sat down and his jacket bunched up. I stood him up, set him like this, right? Rattle off three shots and I was done, okay? I like people standing, you can move them around more. All right, go ahead, what's your name? Deborah. Deborah, what can I do for you? Um, can you uh, go over the over and under shot again? Sure, let's go back to over and under beauty. <coughs> that shot or the? Yeah, yeah, that one. That shot. How did you do that? How did you do it in the living room? Yeah, you said it was in the living room. That's it right there. You're looking at it. That's my couch. That's my dining room table on the right. I used to collect World War I posters. That's my World War I poster up on the wall. Um, it's a bright, sunny day. So my, my shutter speed reflected some of the ambient light in the room. It was like 7.1. 7.1. What's your name again, hon? Uh, Deborah. Deborah. One of the things that happens when you shoot over and under beauty or clamshell lighting is that your light, when you get the whole thing set up, it's really close to your subject. So, so much light's coming out and bouncing off the reflector and back up into under the chin, under the nose and eyes that your, your aperture becomes deeper. Because if you're not playing with shutter speed, you're gonna be playing with aperture, okay? Um, I don't shoot a lot of high speed sync, so I don't go beyond one over 250th of a second. And when I do shoot high speed sync, um, I do things a little bit differently because I had a lot of problems doing that over the past, so I stick with um, a shutter speed of 250, then I start moving aperture up and down, okay? Someone had the hand. You said uh, someone else made something similar to the Sun Pulse? Uh, yeah, what's your name? Aquino. Aquino, so Aquino asked if somebody else makes something similar to the California Sun Bounce. Uh, yes, Lastalite has a product, I think it's called the Tri-Grip, and I believe they have a bracket that will allow you to mount it to a light stand, all right? So it's another brand to look at which I think is less expensive than California Sunbox. What can I do for you? Uh, two questions. Um, can you go back to Shufu Direct? Uh, uh, certainly. What's your name? Uh, Frank. Uh, right there. Yep. I wish you could zoom in a bit more. I can't see exactly how the flash is set up there. Oh, yeah, because I took the shot while it was firing. Okay, here it is. I'm standing here. You're my subject. We're probably seven or eight feet away. Light stand, speed light, umbrella, it's right here above me. If you have an eight foot light stand, push it all the way up and you're done. Literally, that's all you're done. What's your name? Francis. Francis, what can I do for you? With the direct flash, what's the zoom setting on your speed light? Is it automatic or is it on 24 or? This right here? It's on whatever the default was, probably 24 millimeters. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a default kind of guy. Um, I know what you're saying, Francis. You can mod Francis is asking what my zoom setting is on the flash head here, okay? So you can change and alter the look of your photographs if you zoom the flash head in or out, all right? I'm a default kind of guy. Take my flash out of my bag, take the omnibounce off it, and whatever the factory setting is, there we go. I like the default setting because I don't have to think about it, number one. And number two, usually it's wide enough to give me a nice spread of light. And I'm telling you, if you try this, this is a great technique it's a lot of fun, and you can get some great looks. And it's, it's I love, I love, I love this look. It's really simple. I love the simplicity of the look, right? I mean, let's figure it out. How many people own more than one speed light? Okay. How many people use more than one speed light? Okay. How many people? Let's go. Keep going. How many people have three speed lights? Four, five, six, seven, eight. <laughs> I have nine. I don't know why every. <laughs> decided to get nine, <laughs> nine speed lights, but anyways, um, and I did a shoot where I used all nine of them, and it was really great. I did a fashion look, I did a, a, a runway look where we used nine speed lights, and uh, it was one of those experimental things because I don't use that many. My camera bag holds three speed lights, and that's what I bring with me every day. Um, it was a lot of fun to set up, really hard to execute because they had a, a, um, a key light above, a ring light for fill, a kicker light below, two edge lights, two edge lights behind my set, a hair light, and an edge light um, to light the background with a grid. And uh, it was really hard to set up. So stick with two or three, because it's much easier. <laughs> What's your name? Irene, I have two questions. Go ahead, Irene.
Oh, 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 behind her right now? This is a great technique, and I'm glad you brought that up, Irene. You can change that shadow by moving your subject back to or away from the background. So in, in the final, I have her as back as far as she'll go to the white seamless before she steps through where the sweep is. Okay, before she takes that heel and punctures that white paper and ruins it for me forever, um, I've got her as far as I can go. You can get that shadow even closer if you can put that person right on the wall. But if you drag that person off the wall by like two feet, that shadow gets deeper. And you can do a really cool pose like this and have the shadow of her arms fall back on her. It's really a great deal. Experiment. Definitely experiment. Go ahead, second question. You had two parts? The reflector, um, silver or white? I use white. 99% of the time, my reflector is on the white side, uh, not the silver side. I think the silver side gives a touch too much. Uh, it's too hard. And I'll go over that. I have a slide later on that shows you the difference between using white and silver. OK? OK, go ahead. What lens are you using for this shot? You it's John, right? Jeff, and you're, Jeff I'm sorry. You're, you're about 16 feet away, it looks like. Or yep, I'm about 12 to 14 feet away. So Jeff asked how far away from my subject, about 12 feet in that neighborhood. OK? Um, I'm using a 70 to 200 uh, vibration reduction lens. Because as I get older, I'm getting shakier. And um, I like the longer lenses for compression. Okay, But also, with this lighting look, if you step forward, you are actually stepping into the light on your subject. So if I step forward four or five feet, you would see my shadow uh, on her legs. You would see my outline, right? Which is much better, you know. So Richard asks why I use the sun bounce and not a reflective umbrella. This is the reason. And it, it was, it, I took this about two years ago. It was not for this presentation. I, um, I'm a lighting junkie, right? When I come to B&H Photo, I can tell you, you ask anybody who knows me, first place I go is lighting department. <coughs> and I'm checking out the new Ellen Chrome, the new Hensel. I'm seeing what Pro Photo's got going, right? And I'm dreaming because I left strobe lighting for speed lighting. So, you know, I want that really cool, great gear. Um, but I like to manipulate and try new things. And in that regard, I tried this instead, all right? So if I have a client who says they like that shot, it's already in my, it's already in my, in my memory bank. So okay. you take one of each? <laughs> uh, it depends. Um, I may take one of each. I happen to like the hard edge drop shadow behind her, okay, and a lot of the light that's hitting that wall. Uh, in this instance, it worked really well. Gave me a good exposure for a bright, hazy day while we were in the shade. Um, it's something new. That's the whole reason behind this, is to, to give you something new. Um, okay, go ahead. You said strobe light. Isn't strobe lighting easier to work with than speed lighting? What's your name again? Charles. Charles. Is, so Charles asked if strobe lighting is easier to work with than speed lighting. So speed lighting is easier for transport. Okay, if you really learn speed lighting, you can make it look like strobe lighting. There's an inherent difference between the two qualities of light. All right, and I have, a, I ha I have a, a couple slides down toward the end here. Um, strobe lighting has a circular flash tube, and speed lights have a rectangular flash tube. So the light out of a speed light is inherently sharper and faster, because it really isn't meant to be doing this stuff that we're doing. But a strobe light is, and when the light exits a strobe, it exits in that circular pattern, so it's immediately a different quality of light. All right, if I have my druthers, I would probably run around with a couple of battery packs and a couple of strobe lights. Um, I need to make a living. That means I need to work quickly. If anybody's ever shot editorial, you know that editorial needs to go fast. So you roll in, set up your job, take your shots, and you roll out. That's okay. Uh, that is the over under? Sure. Um, that shot of a setup shot. Yeah. Yep. Sitting She's sitting on the stool? Yeah, and she's looking, I'm slightly above her, so she's looking up to me a little bit. And I can't, I can't make out what that umbrella is doing. Can you just keep Sure. Okay. Set your umbrella onto your um, umbrella bracket and tip it all the way forward as far as it will go till the umbrella actually touches the light stand. Can't go any further. Okay. Actually, what happens is you've created this, this clamshell appearance, right? Because the umbrella is like this and you have the uh, reflector down below. When you bring your subject in, the main part of the light, that central hot part, the middle part, actually skims over the top of the head. 
And all the light that's hitting your subject is light that's coming out and around uh, the umbrella and hitting the reflector, which is great because you want to avoid that central hot spot. You'll avoid clipped highlights because that's always hard and um, ridiculously impossible to fix later on. So you want to avoid that. You know, try this. Try this at home. I mean, it's really a great way to light people. And that was, that was a great shot. She looks fabulous. So Ruth asked about the sweet spot of your lens. And she's saying that because I'm using higher end lenses and she's using, quite possibly, right? I wouldn't know. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm using higher end lenses. I'm shooting at 5.6. I may be getting a better result at 5.6. This speaks to Ruth knowing your gear. Know your gear. If your sweet spot um, is eight, and you get everything sharp in the photo at f8, okay, but you know at 5.6 your edges are a touch soft, okay, you can do a couple of things. Right? You can boost your ISO to 400, and you just went from 5.6 to 8, and now you're cool. Okay? If not, if you can't do that, right, um, shoot to crop. All right? Shoot your subject to crop. So if I'm doing a headshot, and I know I'm shooting at, say, f2.8, a natural light. I know my fall off around the edges of the lens is a little bit soft. I'm going to put my person in the middle where I know it's sharp and then I can crop it later. Okay? It speaks to knowing your gear. Know what you have. I, I've, I don't step out my door without, I'm always testing, I'm always shooting, I'm always doing something okay, to figure out how I can make my work better and do it faster. And like I said, if you shoot editorial, I shoot a lot of editorial back home and it's, it's rapid. It's you show up at a restaurant, you shoot the food, they don't want you there because it's probably five o'clock in the afternoon and dinner hour is coming in. Um, you, need to, you need to get the work done and then move along. So really know your gear. And it sounds like you do. So you're ahead of the game. <laughs> okay, shall we move forward? Or a couple more questions. Move forward? All right, good. V flats. Has anybody ever seen V flats or what's commonly known as a bookend? Yeah, okay. Who's seen them? Who's used them? Anybody shot into them? I love V-flats. I think they're awesome. The quality of light is amazing out of a V-flat. Okay, so my exposure here changes. OM125 to F5, ISO 500. In this particular series, I dropped my aperture just a little bit because uh, I wanted to keep my ISO down. I didn't want to go to 800 or above. I balance this daylight again. To make a V-flat or a bookend, you purchase two pieces of quarter inch uh, foam core or half inch foam core or polystyrene. You lay them on the floor together, run a piece of tape down the center, and you stand them up. And you open it like a book. And that's all that it is. It's a perfect way to reflect light. It's a perfect way to bounce light into and around a room, okay, or to flag light off. Um, in this particular instance, I'm shooting into my V flats. So I place my light source at about the center. So here's my setup in my small studio back home. I've got an SB910, manual mode at half power, okay? Um, this particular quarter, this is quarter inch foam core. I cut uh, a solid foot and a half off the top because it can be a pain to maneuver around the room, all right? Um, I opened it up, I shoved my light into it. I took my model, put her, I had her up against the white wall and I wound up pulling her off the white wall about two feet. So she's about two feet off the white wall. I'm probably six feet away from her with this whole setup. And that's literally out of the camera. I did a little skin softening, and that's all that I did. All right? The light is flat, but she's not flatly lit. She's beautifully lit, I think. Right? You have, it's almost like using a ring light without the expense of a ring light. Okay? And this is really simple to do. You stick your light into the corner, take a shot, and you're done, okay? Okay, B flats or bookends part two. There's, there's, three, there's three, or three or four to this uh, section in the V flats. I love the V flat. I just think it's such, a, it's such a versatile tool to modify light. But the problem comes here, is if you don't own a pickup truck or you live in Manhattan, how are you gonna run around with four foot by eight foot sheets of foam core? You're not. Right? Or you're going to rent them from somewhere. Uh, there's a place in, here, uh, in the city here called the Set Shop. Maybe you hear of the Set Shop? Yeah. Where you can buy all this stuff. All right? 
and they sell uh, a couple of different brands, a couple of different name brands of the, of the polystyrene and the foam core. Problem comes in though, how are you gonna carry it around if you don't drive a truck? All right, so in the next set, I'm gonna use um, two, I'm gonna, one one twenty fifth to F5 again, ISO 500, white balance daylight. I'm using two impact five in one reflectors clamped at the seam, all right, with the white side. They're fantastic. They're 42 inches by 72 inches, so you can reflect for an entire person, right, or a big group. Uh, you unzip the outside cover, you have a translucent uh, diffusion screen in the middle, you get white, black, gold, and silver. So you get five different choices to modify your light. Here's my setup, okay? I literally took my foam core, pushed it out of the way, and set this up. Stuck my light right into it, and here is the resultant shot. You guys ready? Same thing, look at that. And these things, once you figure it out, I'm not gonna say it's easy, once you figure out how to twist these things together, it's about a 25 or 24 inch diameter uh, circle. Fits, you can put it over your shoulder, hop on the subway, right? Take a taxi and you can get to your location or shoot in your studio or whatever with the reflectors. All right, so let's go back to that. I just popped them open. You'll see there's a bracket on the tippity top that I use to hang them from. And I'm gonna show you how to make that bracket. Just a couple of small pieces that I got here at B&H. And that bracket allows the reflector to hang vertically, perfectly vertically. Because if you've ever used a large reflector, if you clamp it to the top of a light stand, it sits at an angle, right? We want to get rid of that. I'm going to show you how to do that. Go ahead. Where does the model go? She's right against the wall. She's utterly against the white wall. I'll show you. There's a, there's a, there's a photo later on of where she's posed. She's right against the wall. The model's. So if I were doing this and I was the model, I'm right here. And then where the where the beach About five feet that way. Yep. Yeah. I'll show you, you'll see it. Okay, so I shot two-thirds body. Again, this is right out of the camera. She didn't even need any skin smoothing. She's gorgeous. Okay, B-flats are bookends part two. Here, I did the same exact thing, but I was curious about using the silver side of the reflector. The silver side um, provides, your light out of the silver side is harder. Okay, exposure remained the same, but the quality of light is harder. So what happened was, there's the silver side, see that? Okay. The shadows are harder. See the shadow under her left arm? Okay, in the previous photo, the shadows were soft because the light coming out of the white is just soft and beautiful and reflective, okay? But the light out of the silver is harder. So it goes in fast and it comes out fast. I didn't quite like that. I thought that was too, too much for me, okay? You could zoom in and do a headshot and not have to worry about it, but the simple fact that the silver gave me such hard light, uh, if you were to try this, I would say stick with white, right? Because white gives you a smoother um, and a nicer feel and a nicer finished product. Okay, I have a bonus, then we'll go to the behind the scenes shot. I wanted to try a strobe light. I wanted to see if there was any quality of light difference between a larger light source and a speed light. So I got my foam core back up, okay? Figuring I just stick with foam core. Um, my shutter speed is 1 1 25th. My aperture went to 7.1 because the strobe light is so much more powerful, right? There's so much more power in a strobe light. ISO is 200, white balance is daylight. Um, I use two of the same, ref I, I'm sorry, this should say uh, the um, foam core because it is foam core. I think I swapped two slides, okay? So here's my setup. It's a Profoto 300 watt, se watt second compact. Stuck it right in, all right. I took a quick shot. Quality of light's the same. This is an instance where the quality of light is the same between speed light and strobe light. But look at it, it's so beautiful and soft. She's right up against a piece of gray seamless paper. I taped up to a wall and that's it. And I think the behind the scenes shot is, um, no, it's down towards the end. I'll get to it though, I'll get to it, don't worry. Um, I do, there is a behind the scenes shot of me using the entire setup. Um, it comes after the part where I show you how to make those nice little cool little brackets, all right? It's there though, I didn't mess that up. Okay, so what do we think about shooting into V-flats? Awesome, isn't it? Quality of light is absolutely fantastic. 
Okay, if you use the impact brand reflector or any kind of reflector that you can open and close easily, you can have a great result on location anywhere. Okay, this is one of my favorite things to teach. One light into two. And I love one light into two, and I did it in here one, one afternoon. So what you do is your, your, your shutter and your aperture are gonna vary depending on your location. This particular set of shots was shot outside. And I tried to make the speed light look like the sun, okay? This is very similar to just using a reflector in daylight. Um, ISO 200, white balance is daylight, bare head flash, and a California Sunbounce Micro Mini again. Okay, so we're, we're in an alleyway, and we're shooting with the model, and behind her, it's a bright sunny day. But the buildings are so tall that there's no sun coming down. But I wanted to make it look like there was sun coming down and hitting her hair and her shoulder, okay? So in order, I only have one speed light with me, with my reflector. So I have a speed light mounted high and above to mimic the sun coming down. And I have a reflector uh, up against a, a brick wall that are being held by an assistant, okay? And what we did was we just splashed light across the top of her head, back into the reflector, and we got a key light. So we have a hair light, shoulder light, into the reflector, backed up for a, key, a main light or a key light, all right? And it looks like the sun's coming over the top of the building. Got it? All right, so if you look down the end of the, end of the alleyway, the sun's bright there. So it looks like the sun's coming over the building and main light and hair lighting her, shoulder lighting her, and key light, right? Face light. Really a great shot, great kid too, and a nice gal named Kim. Um, all right, one light into two, part two. See, this is growing beyond 16 looks. Uh, this is the same thing I did this in the studio. Okay, 1 125th to 5.6. My ISO went up here a little bit to 250. White balance daylight, bare head flash, California sun bounce again. Okay, so I took a piece of um, seamless paper and I taped it to the wall. Great tip for you guys, you can have a couple of five foot um, wide pieces of, of seamless paper. Just roll it up off the floor and tape it to the wall. Use some gaffer tape, you can tape it to the wall and then you just undo the gaffer tape and roll it back up again. And you can use multiple color uh, paper backgrounds without having to carry around all that extra uh, um, light stands and a crossbar and all that nonsense. Just tape it to the wall. So the model's here. I chose brown for a background because she had a really nice brown toned skin. She wore that gold dress um, and she has like blonde hair. So I wanted to keep the tone the same. I have a bare head flash behind her head. It's aiming from behind her head right out to the reflector. In this instance, the reflector is the silver side because I needed to bring a lot of light back in to the front. Okay, so the key light is behind her head. It's skimming behind her head, hitting the reflector and coming back. And this is what I wound up, wound up with for a headshot. Which I thought was great, right? It's beautiful soft light coming back onto her. Um, I could have lit her from the other side. I chose a lighter from this side because I liked how her hair fell over her right eye, how that shadow came in, right? I'm short lighting her a little bit, all right? I really like that. It drew some attention to her left eye, all right? That was my, wasn't really my intention, just kind of happened that way. If you ever have that happen to you where things really work out and you like it, you just tell them that that's the way you wanted it. Okay, one light into three. If, who's a beginning, who's beginning in small flashes? All right, good. Who's more advanced, intermediate, professional? Okay, good. All right. I, this is one of my favorite things to do. And I like doing this because within a matter of seconds, you can change the look of your photo. All right. Um, shutter and aperture are the same. They are ISO 200. What's the white balance? Daylight. Um, I'm using an impact 42 by 72 translucent diffusion panel. So I pulled off the cover. I just have a diffusion panel and a Matthews Hollywood grip arm. Okay, what I've done here on the left is the speed light's high, and it's aiming down a little bit, right? You get that light coming down to capture that almost sunlight look where you're getting uh, light crossing the subject's face. The translucent panel is softening the light. The speed light has the plastic omnibounce on it to bounce some light around the room, okay? If you look at the background, the background's kind of dark. That translucent panel is hiding a lot of light uh, from the background. In this instance, the final 
you're seeing a lot of shadow detail. Okay, you're getting a lot of light on her right side, you're getting a lot of shadow detail on her left side, and you're getting a darker background. Okay, so we have one speed light, one uh, translucent panel. Now we're going to take that translucent panel and we're going to swing it. We're not going to move the light stand, we're just going to take that Hollywood grip arm and go from this angle and swing it out further. So all I did was, see how much fun she's having? All I did was take the translucent panel from covering the light and I opened it up. Now the light's bouncing more, a little bit more around the room. Now the background is opened up. Look at the pattern of light on the floor. See it? Now I've opened the background up. Now I've taken that shutdown light and I've made it wide open. Now look at the shot. Okay, background's brighter, light is softer, all right, and it's, it's actually uh, almost have a fill light on the left side of her face because it's so soft through the diffusion panel. And now for our last look in this light, one light into three, part three. Aperture, shutter, ISO, everything remains the same. In this look, I brought a reflector in. And I took that second um, 42 by 72 reflector with the white side, and I brought it in close. So now that light is lighting the background, it's key lighting our subject, hitting our reflector, and giving us this beautiful wide open fill. Look at that. All right, so within a short period of time, you can give your client three different looks with the same background. And I have one more slide here, hang on. Go back to the, the first one. Hang on, I have all, all three here. So the setup. The setup of the first one? Yep. Oh, okay. See it? It's hiding, it's actually hiding the light. It's utterly shutting the light down from uh, the background. But as soon as you swing it out of the way and light hits the background, it opens it right up. And you're getting some reflection from the other side of the room. Yeah. Like. I'm getting a little bit of reflection from the other side of the room, especially here when I move that diffusion panel. My studio is painted white for that reason. All right, if you guys have a space, paint it white. Let's do, a, let's do a, all three, okay? Look one on the left, look how dark the background is. Look two on the right. All I did was swing the, the, the diffusion panel to one side. Look three on the left, I brought a reflector in. And that's it. And look how wide open those shadows are on the very last photo. So you can literally have a client come in, set this up, boom, one look, dramatic, second look, not so, third look, clean, and really uh, pleasing. So you can do a lot with a little in a very short amount of time. Let's go down to, okay, let's go down to the connectors. This is the hardware part. We can do the hardware, we have one more look, and then we'll do questions and we'll wrap it up. What do we say? Good. All right, good. Okay, if you ever hung a reflector one of those fold-out reflectors off a light stand, you know that when you clamp it to the top, it hangs on an angle, especially the tall ones. And we don't want that. We want them to hang straight. So when you make your V-flat, you clamp them in the back, and they stay straight. Otherwise, you're farting around, and they're on an angle, and you're trying to fix it, and oh, it can be such a nightmare. So anyways, I made these brackets, and they're very simple. I uh, three pieces. I got them here at B&H. I use a mat what's called a Matthews cheater arm a Manfrotto nano clamp, and I have a Manfrotto 5 8 to 3 8 rapid adapter. Uh, I was just downstairs looking in the lighting department, and there's an impact lighting adapter that's a little bit cheaper than the Manfrotto, and I'm gonna go pick one up when I leave. The one thing you have to purchase is from a home center or a hardware store is a 3 8 lock washer. It should cost you 20 cents, okay? So what you do, on the right is the cheater adapter, in the middle is the rapid clamp, and on the left is the nano clamp. And you take the nut off of the rapid clamp in the middle, the rapid adapter in the center, and you put that on top of your light stand. And you crank that down, okay? And then you take the washer, and you put it in between the clamp and the rapid adapter. So in the final, you've got the nut tightened down on top of the, uh, the light stand, and you've got all that assembled just like that. That goes right on top of your light stand. And that holds your reflector probably five inches away. So when you raise your light stand, the reflector goes from being like this to being vertically. Right? Perfect. You have to put the nut on the light stand because the nut on the, on the cheater adapter is in the middle. And when you tighten it down, it's going to want to hit the threads. It's just going to mangle all the threads. 
So if you put the nut on there and tighten it nice and tight, you'll have a flat surface for that thumb screw to land on. And everything will lock down tight and it'll be awesome because nothing will fall down, nothing will hit your client, they won't storm out angry, and everything will work out just right, right? Because it always does. And there it is in practice. That's what it looks like, all right? It's easy to build, it's only a couple of pieces, and it works like a champ. We'll talk about this. If you have any questions, we'll go over this. Here is it, here it is. This is the behind the scenes shot of the V-flats working. And I, I put this one in because you can see the V-flats clamped in the back, all right? They're hanging vertically. I put them right together. I put two spring clamps on. I'm probably eight feet, seven or eight feet from the subject. She's right up against the wall and bam, take your shot, you have that beautiful soft light wrapping your subject. The nice thing about shooting into the V-flat is you can actually um, change the light. If you step to one side and cover one side of the V-flat, you'll get more light on the left. If you step to the left and cover, you get more light on the right. If you stay in the center, then you get that wrapping, perfect, that perfectly wrapped light. Okay, I turned this presentation into a book on Blurb. You guys wanna pick it up? Just go to blurb.com, um, search One Speed Light 16 Looks. You can purchase it as an ebook, PDF, or a book, real book. Okay? I'll keep that up for just a second. And then I won't go to the last slide. Let's go to questions. Uh, so, Helen asked if I get glare or uh, any of the, uh, the, the lighting flare into the camera. Um, there's two ways to, to um, you can do that, put the, flare in your, put the flare in for creative effect, right? It's very popular now, right? You see natural lit portraits, they're all smoky and have that flare coming through. Um, use your lens hood and then choose a spot that that doesn't happen with. So if I move more closely like this where the light's coming into my lens, I will get that. But if I move over to here, I won't get that. But also use your lens hood. Uh, you're given a lens hood because for a reason. Right? It keeps stray light out of entering the edge of the lens. Uh, there's another reason for that, is that if you're in a crowd of people, no one touches your front lens element. Okay? That if you're banging around with a bunch of people at a wedding or you're, you're doing whatever. Um, I had a situation where someone touched my front element and they were sweaty. And all my photos from Disney of my kids are now blurry because the element was co covered in their sweat from their elbow. Uh, so use your lens hood. And add that, add that for effect, try that, try doing that. I love doing that crazy stuff. People don't like it, but I like that. What are you gonna do? You take 300 photos, you gotta do something different, right? All right, if you do a portfolio sitting, you're looking at at least 300 shots. Um, because you can go through so quick, you can change lighting looks so quickly with a speed light and a couple of reflectors. Okay, who's up? Okay. Do you use soft boxes? Do I use soft, what's your name again? Richard. Richard, I do use soft boxes. Um, uh, I do use soft boxes for my uh, corporate work. My corporate headshots are all shot with uh, a Creative Light soft box. If you guys are looking for a great soft box solution, uh, I use Creative Light. They no longer manufacture boxes, now they manufacture the Profoto RFIs uh, under that brand name. They have a great speed ring uh, for a, a speed light. And it's really strong and it works really well. It's a 24 by 36. I think 24 by 36 is the best size for a soft box for a speed light. It really gives you the best coverage and soft. Which you prefer, the umbrella or? Which do I prefer? I prefer the umbrella. Why do I prefer the umbrella, you're going to ask? I can tell, I can see I can see that question coming out. <laughs> Why do I prefer the umbrella? Portable. Portable. If it breaks, it's 30 bucks, right? Not 300. Okay, we got how many different looks? We, we rolled through five different looks with an, or six looks with an umbrella, okay? Reflective, reflective with a reflector, reflective side light, crunched, which I know is a really a cool, that's a big hit, that's always a good, a good, and shoot through, right, in a couple different configurations. You can do a lot with a little, and if it falls over, how much is it? 30 bucks, 30 bucks. doesn't break the bank, right? A, a nice Profoto RFI is going to run you 300 easy. Yeah. <coughs> Jeff asked if I could use something other than Pocket Wizards, like the Nikon Creative Lighting System, okay, or another uh, triggering system. Absolutely. When you're inside, that works easy because the infrared bounces around the room. When you're outside, that's when you run into problems because the infrared doesn't, the sender, the receiver may not see the sender. 
Um, I've gotten good results, like 20, 30 feet away if you're aiming your light right at the receiver, but it can be a little difficult to get your uh, result that you want. Um, I like the pocket wizards, they're reliable. Uh, they just work. You put it on your camera and they work. And I've had instances of using other branded triggers and you put it on your camera and they don't work. You know, and if, hang on, if you, like I ran a workshop, someone came, anybody ever see an, uh, um, a, a Sigma camera, like in real life? <laughs> I couldn't believe it. The guy rolls in with a Sigma SD Merrill. Like, and I, I was like, oh my God, this thing is so cool. I've never really seen one. I've seen the advertisement, but never really saw one. And I put a pocket wizard on top of his camera. He went to work. Canon G10 could shoot. Olympus OMD can shoot. Um, Sony's, Sony has that crazy old hot shoe from Minolta. I carry an adapter with me. I stick it on and the guy can put a pocket wizard on and shoot. So for me, um, because I run so many workshops and, and things of that nature, but Nikon CLS will work for you, absolutely. So if you have a camera that doesn't have commander mode, you can actually use one? Absolutely, Deborah's asked if your camera doesn't have a commander mode, the Nikon CLS, what do you, camera do you shoot, Deborah? Uh, D5200. D5200, that doesn't have commander mode? No. Then, um, actually, uh, you can. Do you have two flashes or one? Two, two flashes? Oh, I'll give you guys a little trick. You ready? Yeah. <laughs> set your second, if you have two flashes, right, set your second flash into slave mode. All right? You have an SB800, it's SU4, and the Nikon mode is SU4. I'm not sure about the Canon or anybody else, but as long as that infrared receiver can see a master flash, you can aim it toward the receiver and it will flash. Put something over that flash so you hide it from your subject and it will work outside. Um, I ran a workshop uh, last year with uh, Rogue Flash Benders where all my attendees had on-camera flashes, at Canon, Nikon, and Sony. And I put a large Rogue Flash Bender on the on-camera flash. And as long as my SB800 saw the flash fire, the receiver would see it, it would fire. So I had two lights going with multiple cameras and multiple uh, <coughs> systems going. As long as that is in slave mode and it will see the key light, it will fire. So you don't have to purchase any crazy um, triggers. Well, that's good. It's great. It's great. My goal is always to get you not to waste your money, but buy things that are useful to you, right? You don't want to spend all of your money on a million different things because it's a great way to wind up with no money. Irene asked if I do on-camera flash, and yes, I do on-camera flash. Um, no, I don't use the Rogue Flash Benders. I usually use a white bounce card. I make my bounce cards out of uh, white foam paper. Um, mostly for off-camera. I like them better for off-camera flash. Um, I, in the interest of full disclosure, I am sponsored by them. They send me all over the country running workshops for them. Uh, my signature look with them is the 40s glamour look. If you want to see a shot, I can show you. This is a 40s glamour style shot I do with three speed lights. Let me see if I can't pull this out. Um, uh, this is a, a key light with a, a large rogue flash bender rolled into a snoot, a hair light with a large rogue flash bender rolled into a snoot, and a uh, rogue grid for the background. And the background is just black uh, foam core and it's what they had on hand. And I got this great shot out of that. All right. Um, I, I, my on-camera flash, I don't shoot events anymore. So any on-camera flash is usually um, like on the run or if I had to do a quick portrait or something. Um, the key to on-camera flash is taking your head and swiveling it around. What do you use? Yeah, I don't use a white card that's in. I use a piece of white foam paper. So go to, um, Go to a, a Walmart, go to a CVS, and get the craft paper. You know what I'm talking about? And then you cut it into pieces, like six by six, and put it on your flash. I use that instead. It's like half a snoot. Very similar to the Rogue Flash Bender, uh, but it doesn't weigh anything. Flash benders have some weight to them, and they may take your flash head and make it go flat. We don't want that. We want it up, we want to bounce it around the room. Okay? Um, I do use the flash benders a lot in my work but uh, not for bouncing like that. Mm, I love the umbrella. You guys you all get umbrellas. If you don't have umbrellas, go get one. And if it rains out, you're covered. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is my friend Bernadette. Let's see. We did in the 40s glamour style. Here's the behind the scenes. 
okay? There's a rogue flash bender rolled into a snoot for the key light, rogue flash bender rolled into a snoot for a hair light, and a rogue grid that I uh, sent through um, an old door frame for the background light, for that go-between, okay? Which is very atypical of a 40s glamour shot where something is behind the subject, because normally they would be shot on a blank wall. So to shoot tethered, I, sh I use Capture One Pro 6 right now. I'm using Capture One. They just upgraded the Pro 7, but I haven't done it yet. Uh, I will upgrade when they go on sale. They usually go on sale around April, May. Uh, I like Capture One. It's my software of choice, and um, I love shooting tethered. It's awesome. You know, if you're on the road, it's not so easy, but if you're in a studio, it's great. Absolutely shoot tethered if you can. When I use sp so Soren asked when I would use speed light versus continuous light. Um, I, I shoot continuous light for my actor style headshots. Uh, I shoot fluorescent light very in the strain of Peter Hurley, if you know him. Okay. Uh, I don't use Kino flows because unlike him, I can't afford them. <clears throat> so here we go. So this is Jessica Robolino. Okay. Constant light. I have two four foot strip banks of uh, fluorescent light and two speed lights in the background. Here's my behind the scenes shot, okay? I've got two four foot fluorescent lights that I built myself and uh, two SB800s on the background into reflective umbrellas to make the background white. Uh, when I shoot under this light, I shoot an ISO 800. So my speed lights are on a quarter power in the back and I can go white. I can make my background go white shooting speed lights at a quarter power. So here's my setup. There she is, she's a budding actress. And there's a final. Okay? Speed lights and two homemade fluorescent lights. What are they made of? Ah, I knew that was coming next. So Steve asked, what kind of fluorescent lights? Okay, who else asked that? Who wants to know about my lighting? Sure. <laughs> okay. <coughs> oh, pardon me. <clears throat> There's a photographer in Pennsylvania. You're all going to write this down now, because if you're interested in doing this, write this guy's name down, because he's got the video that I watched and built them. His name is Joe Edelman, E-D-E-L-M-A-N. He's out of Allentown, Pennsylvania, and he's got this great video on how to build them. I went to Lowe's, and I bought two four-foot, four-light, fluorescent shop lights. It costs you about 80 bucks for two of these things. You buy um, daylight balanced uh, bulbs. These are T8 bulbs, not T12s, T8s. Okay, you have to use T8 bulbs. The reason for that is they, they have less flicker than the T12s. So your shutter speed can go beyond 250. Okay? And that was it. I followed his, his video. I bought all the pieces for like 120 bucks. I assembled them, and that's what I use. And look at the result. Result's awesome. Okay, and I didn't spend $3,000 on Kino flows. Because two four foot, four bank Kino flows are about $2,700. And I can, you know, I'm a working man photographer. How many bulbs in your bank? Four each, four bulbs each, T8s. Make sure you get a light that has T8s. The only thing I did was, um, the inside of the reflector is painted white. The reflectors come silver, you gotta spray paint them white. Because if the silver will make your subject squint, but the white um, is not as contrasty, they'll be able to have open eyes. I set my camera on my uh, tripod, shutter speed of 1 125th of a second, aperture of about 6.3, 7.1, depending on how the subject's skin tone, ISO 800. Um, Joe Edelman, E-D-E-L-M-A-N. Watch his video. What was the light balance? White balance, I do custom white balance under this light. If you, guys, if you guys choose to build these lights, which I highly recommend, you'll need to take a custom white balance because they favor the yellow and green side, terribly so. So if you take a custom white balance, you'll get a good white balance out of the gate. I used a uh, Expo Disc. Expo Imaging makes what's called the Expo Disc. And this shot you're looking at on the left is right out of the camera. No retouching, no nothing. I shot tethered, and I adjusted my exposure, and that's an out of the camera shot. Um, if you, who has an Expo disc here? Anybody? You know how to go? You guys know how to use it? Okay. You take the Expo disc, 
and you put it in front of your lens, okay, and then you aim it towards the key light, and you take your custom. You shoot a Nikon or Canon? Yeah. Canon? You shoot, it you shoot it, and then you take that photograph, and you assign that white balance of that photograph to your set in the custom white balance setting. Nikons are different. You want a white balance for the key light, because that's where all of your light's coming from. I got a, a white balance of a 5189 with a tint of like 6.3. So what happens is this particular kind of light, because it's not made for photography, it's not specifically made and designed for photography, it will give you a crazy tint color. So you'll have like a really good white balance, but then it'll be tinted to the green or to the yellow side. And you'll be wondering how can you got to take all the yellows out of that photo? And that's the reason why. But if you take a custom white balance, all that's handled for you. I took a custom, it went into my laptop, I took a test shot, it was perfect, just went to work. And what if you're doing an event? Do you do that as well? Events are tougher because it usually isn't enough time. Um, who shoots events here? Okay, I don't shoot events much anymore. I do some once in a while. Um, get yourself, you know what you want to do for event work, what I do? <clears throat> I use a Kodak Gray card. Anybody ever hear of this? Okay, if you purchase a Kodak Gray card from B&H Photo, you get this great little package for like $30. You get two 8x10 cards, and you get a bonus like 4x5 card. I take the 4x5 card, I stick it in my pocket. And if I'm under a crazy lighting situation, I take it out, take a shot of it under that lighting situation, and then go to work. Then go back, click on that with my white balance dropper, correct it right there, and then correct that whole set. In Lightroom? In, light, I don't, yeah, in Lightroom. If you're in Lightroom, yes. Yeah. They fill up enough time. Thank you so much for coming. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, B&H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.